Greetings, everyone. Uh, this actually turned out to uh, start an hour earlier than I thought it was. I was actually just now checking on my computer. As it turns out, uh, it was put up as an 8 a.m. PST time, uh, which was a little bit of a miscommunication between Glenn and I in that I thought it was going to be a 9 a.m., so a little caught off guard. But what we're going to talk about today is uh, cholesterol on a low-carb diet, and uh, I have some information to share, which uh, before I do, I want to kind of go into a little bit more of my own backstory. Um, my name is Dave Feldman. I actually started a ketogenic diet um, a little less than two years ago. And in so doing, uh, I found out probably about seven months in that my cholesterol had skyrocketed. And after that happened, I started learning everything that I could uh, about cholesterol, in particular how cholesterol affects a low-carb diet. Uh, so it was something I was particularly interested in finding out more about. And uh, since then, I've, I've also done an enormous amount of experimentation, uh, what we would call in science N of 1, as in uh, specifically um, uh, a lot of experimentation that I would uh, do uh, in particular with my diet and uh, cross-referencing it against my blood work. And it's gotten really meticulous. Uh, in fact, in the last 14 months, I've actually tracked just about every single thing that I've eaten and drank, including supplements, uh, including water, every single thing that it is. And I've had that tracked against my total um, cholesterol numbers. And uh, what I'm going to show you now is what that's looking like. Hold on one second. Fun look. Oh, sorry. Uh, Facebook Live is giving me some suggestions that I'm now ignoring. <clears throat> so this is the probably one of my favorite graphs of all time, and this is now with a total of 29 blood tests. Over the last 14 months, you can actually see that there's two different lines, and uh, you can probably detect that there's a pattern associated with them. So to get in a little bit closer, if you can see, on this side, we actually have a three-day rolling average of my total dietary um, uh, my total dietary fat. So this dietary fat as it goes down, you can see the other line, the blue line, that's actually my LDL cholesterol. And that goes up as my fat goes down. This was actually, this happened, this very first uh, two points of data, this actually happened right after I'd started the diet. Because, um, or I'm sorry, right after I'd gotten my first cholesterol test. Because once I did, I was actually pretty depressed for a little while. And I started avoiding saturated fat, found that I was just avoiding all food in general. I just generally wasn't having that good of a time. And ironically, after I did my uh, next blood test, which was two weeks after I did the very first one, I was strangely comforted by the fact that my cholesterol had jumped another 100 points. So the first one was around uh, I, I want to say 329 or something like that. And then my second one was around 420. And I may be the only person on the planet that actually got comforted by his cholesterol numbers jumping up with the corresponding drop in the amount of dietary fat that I was eating. But I recognized that that could be the very beginning of a pattern that could show that it actually goes inverse with each other. And sure enough, 29 data points later, that's exactly what we see. On a low-carb diet, when I'm eating less fat, my cholesterol goes higher. When I'm eating more fat, my cholesterol goes lower. And these first, these first data points here was the very beginning of the diet. I took this over to a uh, low-carb veil, um, showed a lot of the doctors there, including uh, Ivor Cummins, and um, decided to go ahead and do a one-week experiment. And that's actually what this little hump is here. This was actually taken one day after the next for a total of uh, five days. And you can actually see that I intentionally arranged for my diet to drop the total amount of fat overall um, and then start increasing it slowly to see the corresponding cholesterol numbers would follow, and sure enough, they did. In fact, to make this a little bit easier, I made one other version of the graph so you can see the, cor the uh, inverse correlation where I flipped this. And so it goes like this. So this is it positively, this is it negatively, as in on this side, this is up is down and down is up. It goes from low, which you can see starting at minus 10 to 
to high, starting at 490. So this would be as my fat goes up. You can see how the uh, cholesterol tracks with it. And that's how we can see a very tight inverse correlation. Go ahead and tell me that there's no relationship between these two lines. Uh, thank you so much, by the way, for uh, Greg and Glenn and Yale joining. Thanks. Um, okay. So I just want to read uh, Greg's comments real quick. Interesting that your chart is reversed left to right. We are seeing a mirror image, but we still get the proper message. Exactly. And that's kind of why I wanted to show. I wanted to show this one first so that you could see how they were positively associated. And I wanted to show this one second. Really emphasize, emphasize that this axis is reversed in order just to see how tightly correlative it is. Now, as you'll notice, there are still some outliers. For example, there's an outlier here where I went to Asia and I couldn't track my nutrition very well, so I don't know how accurate this data point is. And there was one that was over here uh, during um, an unusually stressful time that may have had an impact on my total lipids. I don't know for sure, but I, I, um, I like to point out that I put up every single NMR that I do. I don't actually leave out anything because I believe in the integrity of the data. It's very important to me. So let's actually talk just for a moment about the one thing that I think every single, every single person on a low-carb diet should know about cholesterol, especially if you're afraid of cholesterol. You should know that on a low-carb diet, there's a decent chance that your cholesterol will increase a little bit, or if you're like me, a fraction of you will have your cholesterol increase by a lot. A lot of people think that these are independent numbers, as in cholesterol kind of goes on its own. It's sort of uh, out there in your bloodstream, and um, a lot of people believe, as you know, going back to the Ansel Keys days, that actually the amount of cholesterol you ingest, that you actually eat, will end up in your bloodstream. And as you learn more about the science, you find that, that that's not the case really at all, uh, unless you're a hyper absorber. But there's a particular reason why on a low carb diet, you're gonna find that it goes higher. And uh, per my uh, uh, discussion with Glenn, I wanted to try to see if I can keep this as simple as possible. So I have some very fun visual aids that I brought with me for this. Uh, and I wanna go first with what is probably review for you. <clears throat> You already know about carbs and protein, and you probably have already heard plenty of times that these guys can convert to glucose in the bloodstream. Pretty straightforward. And glucose is great in that if I could just teleport glucose, uh, glucose straight into your bloodstream right now, it's good to go. Your cells can use it for energy right now. Okay, now here's where the confusion kind of starts. A lot of people think that fat immediately gets converted to ketones in your body. Fat being the third micronutrient and the one that we're trying to get a lot of in a low-carb diet, being converted to ketones is something that um, we would favor, and a lot of people think 100% of your energy in your body, and once you go on a low-carb diet, ends up being uh, uh, ketones, and so that's how you end up in a ketogenic state. But this isn't exactly right. Uh, in fact, there's actually very few of the um, fat, usually shorter chain fats, that go straight to the liver and end up becoming ketones. The truth is, most of the fat, vast majority of the fat, actually gets converted to something called triglycerides. And you've probably heard about triglycerides, we'll kind of get into the details on that in a moment. But this is really a form of energy that your cells are getting. It's a very important form of energy because it burns very cleanly, just like ketones. So I wanna get this last little bit, and I promise this is the most complicated of all my graphs, or sorry, of all my uh, visual aids, but it's a very important one for everyone to know. Fat, for the most part, gets converted to triglycerides. Triglycerides end up ultimately making their way to the liver. And from the liver, that's actually where you end up getting your ketones. Now, the reason that this is so important is that a lot of these triglycerides end up feeding your cells without ever getting to the liver in the first place. In fact, most of the energy your cells take up come from triglycerides with a closer second to ketones. Let me repeat that because it's, it's very important for extra emphasis. 
most of your energy, most of your energy going to your cells is going to be in the form of triglycerides. The reason this becomes so extremely important in the case of cholesterol is because these guys don't swim very well. These guys swim great. And I lost my other visual aid. These guys swim great. So again, if I could teleport glucose and ketones, ketones into your body, uh, straight up, they're ready to go. They're, your cells can uptake them right away. No additional work needed. But because triglycerides, because these guys can't swim very well, they need to be put together in something. That's where we get the LDL particle, otherwise known as the low density lipoprotein. This is like a submarine that carries all of your triglycerides. See, because these guys can't swim very well, your body's very smart and it makes a container that can swim very well for them. And it goes ahead and packs it up with a lot of these triglycerides. It's very important. So why does this matter for cholesterol? Because that's also where it puts cholesterol. It puts cholesterol as well as other things such as fat soluble vitamins and actually a number of other things I'm not going to include on this graphic but these two are the main components that are inside of LDL particles. That's why a lot of times people will see their cholesterol change on a low fat diet because if they're getting powered by a lot of these guys and these guys are coming in, the, in one of these containers they're ride sharing with cholesterol. Now, I don't really have a lot of time to get into the complexity of why there are some people who see their cholesterol go down, but to give you a quick technical aside that you can decide if you want to ignore or not, what it comes down to is we don't know how much de novo lipogenesis was happening before you went on a low carb diet if in fact you had higher amounts of cholesterol before. We also don't know how much inflammation was involved before and how much that also uh, offset your lipids. But regardless, in my experience, most people I talk to, they usually see their cholesterol go up by a little bit, with some people like me seeing their cholesterol go up by a lot. Okay, so I want to go ahead and see if I can hit some more of these questions. Looks like Greg has some as well. Interesting, your chairs are versus uh, we are seeing Meyer. Is, the, is that fat you just ate, or is it fat that is released from your adipose tissue? Ah, actually, and I do kind of want to talk about this for a second. So getting back to my graph, uh, because of my own data, granted, at the point in which I started seeing these numbers, my weight had been generally stabilized. So I wasn't in the process of losing a lot of fat, with one exception. The one exception is at the very, very beginning. I lost, um, I want to say something in the neighborhood of like 11 pounds between this first data point and these two data points. And it was at that point that I kind of wondered, uh, with that very large number that came, the 420-something, I want to say 424, um, if that was due to the amount of weight that I had lost between those two data points. And honestly, more and more, because of how tight this data is back and forth to each other and tracking it with my weight gain or loss, I'm now more of the opinion that actually the body is up and down regulating the, um, the total amount of energy from fat in these guys uh, much more uh, predominantly than what's actually coming back from fat loss. I, I honestly believe that fat loss, while it does impact the total lipid numbers, actually probably isn't nearly as significant as everyone thinks it is. I know online a lot of people believe that if you're losing a lot of weight, you don't even need to pay that much attention to your uh, cholesterol numbers. Um, and for the most part, that's probably right, uh, particularly if you're in a state of massive uh, weight loss. But even possibly in a, ma in a state of massive weight loss, you may actually be seeing more of these cholesterol changes being reflective of what your body's actually trying to do. Um, and in that sense, what I'm saying is it's trying to up and down regulate these based on how much energy you have incoming. And that's why I kind of want to tie it back to the, the larger point. The larger point is the reason I have this graph and the reason I can say, hey, I can pig out on fat 
And the more that I pig out on fat and eat lots of it, uh, the lower my cholesterol goes. I believe that's because these are the guys from storage. The cholesterol is really just picking up how much of these total LDL particles are coming, are being upregulated by the liver when I'm not eating a lot of fat. Therefore, when I am eating a lot of fat, I'm not picking up as many of them. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Yeah, actually, one of the things I just realized is there's not really a, uh, there's not really a time kept. I guess I could just look over at the clock here. So I have already taken up about 15, 16 minutes. Does anyone have any questions? Um, I had one other visual aid, which unfortunately I was going to get done in like the last 15 minutes after. But I will say this. Um, I do have some exciting news that I'm going to share in that um, exercise does in fact impact your total lipid numbers. And that's not in the graphs that I have here. I've showed 29 data points. There's actually another uh, 10 or 11 uh, that I'll be having in graphs that I'll be uh, bringing to my presentation in Breckenridge. And I'll give you guys a hint, which is that exercise, sure enough, does have an impact. Um, it has a small marginal impact that it kind of brings it down uh, to some degree. Um, but whether that's a good or bad thing, I don't know that I would say that there's a lot more to say about it. Uh, thank you, Dan and Greg and Robin uh, and Karen. Really appreciate it. So once again, I want to thank uh, um, uh, Adapt, of course, uh, whose products I, I consume quite a bit. Uh, I in no way get any compensation from them, but I might as well because I practically should own stock as much as I buy a lot of their stuff. In fact, I had Adapt meal just this morning. Um, but uh, I also want to say that um, uh, I'm still very much on this diet, even in spite of these cholesterol numbers, because the more that I've learned about it, the more that I find it's really not um, as cut and dry as my own general practitioner was telling me in the first place. And now, ironically, I've, since doing a lot of my data and showing it back to him, he's changed his recommendations and even uh, talked to his colleagues about the same thing because he's starting to realize how dynamic the lipid system really is. So once again, I hope you guys all have a great morning and uh, it was a lot of fun.